This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an iconic television talk show host, producer, and author from New York City, whose immensely successful award-winning interview program, Profiles, is currently ranked at number eight on the Hollywood 411 list of the top 50 talk shows in the world. After a successful broadcasting career with a number of television networks, he created his unique interview program, Profiles, in 1999, and has interviewed well over 500 prominent celebrities, including Christopher Plummer, Robert Wagner, Carol Channing, Smokey Robinson, Joan Collins, Dick Cavett, Joan Rivers, Isaac Hayes, and believe me, I'm just scratching the surface. His TV show, which airs on the NYC Media Network in New York, has won seven telly awards, and those awards are so well-deserved because this man is renowned for his research, insightful questions, compassion, and sincerity. Our guest was honored with the Outstanding Alumni Award from his alma mater, Missouri Valley College, which also bestowed an honorary doctorate upon him in 2012. He's also written two books, a fascinating memoir entitled From the Projects to Profiles, and a beautiful coffee table book entitled Inside Celebrity Profiles, A Visual Journey, which is filled with photos, quotes, and fun facts from the set of his show, featuring some of his most illustrious guests. I'm delighted to welcome the New York icon himself, Mickey Burns. Mickey, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure, Harvey. I didn't know we were rated number eight on the list of talk shows worldwide. That's information I didn't have. You you really did your research. Well, I'm very honored to have you on the show. Our show is number 12, so I'm behind <laughs> you, but I've always looked up to you, so I'm very happy to be anywhere near you on that list, believe me. Well, it was also a pleasure having you on our show a month ago. You were a great guest and a, you have a fascinating background. So thank you for, for joining us on Profiles. Oh, it was a great pleasure. You know, it's rare that I get the chance to interview another interviewer and particularly someone whom I've admired for so long. So this is going to be fun. And I also want to thank you not only for having me on your show, but for making me feel so welcome, Mickey. It was a real joy. Right. Well, you're doing pretty good. I mean, I see some of the guests that you've had, very impressive. I mean, I've been doing this for tw for 21 years. We just, we're banging on 700 episodes, but you're going to catch up rather quickly, I think. Oh, you're a sweetheart. Prior to launching your show, Profiles, in 1999, you were on television in a number of different capacities. What made you decide to focus on becoming an interviewer of celebrities? Well, I, I started out working at Fox and I, I started out behind the camera. I started out actually at Fox as a sound man. And I always wanted to be an interviewer, but when I graduated college, it was BC. You know what that stands for, right? Before, before cable. Before. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of opportunity back then. So I, I was a teacher for a period of time, a coach, an athletic coach. And then I started working at Fox and Rupert Murdoch uh, took over, uh, I guess, in the late 80s. And the first thing he did was cut out all the overtime. So we got a, a, a band of you know production people and we moonlighted on the side because they had to make up the money they weren't making in overtime. And they said, well, Mickey, here's your opportunity. Now you're going to be in front of the camera. They, they, they got a contract with Time Warner, and we were producing a news magazine called Special Edition. And I finally got an opportunity to do what I always wanted, and that was to be a host or, or an interviewer. Uh, so thank you, Rupert Murdoch. Yes, thank you, Rupert Murdoch. The entire New York community thanks you. Do you have a particular philosophy as to what constitutes a good interview? I, I think foremost, uh, research. And I think we talked about this during your interview. I never go into an interview. I, you know, I was doing a live show years ago, 
It was called Staten Island Live. And it was like Larry King Live. And I was interviewing all the newsmakers of the day in the metropolitan New York area. And one day I had a detective on the show who was starting a recreational program for kids. And I had his live television. I had 15 minutes with him. And after five and every answer he gave me was yes, no, very brief. And now I had 10 minutes on live television. I was out of questions. That's dying. I, I was dying. Uh, somehow we got through. But I said, you know, I'm never, ever, ever going to go into an interview again without ha without having more research than I need. And I'll, I'll tell you, over the years, we've done 700 episodes. I can't tell you how many of our, our uh, celebrities have stopped the interview and said to me, Mickey, you really did your research. I appreciate that. I've seen that but myself. Research is the most, and I think the second thing is, is not to be affected, you know, not trying to be an interviewer, not trying to be a TV host, but trying to be very relaxed, like I'm talking to the celebrity in my living room. And I think that relaxes them and it, and, and it relaxes uh, the host as well. So I think those two things are very, very important. And that's interesting because that's exactly what you're known for, your research, your excellent questions, and also putting your guest at ease, making the guest feel that they are in a comfortable space. I can say that having had the experience. Now, when you're interviewing a big star, Mickey, are there areas of questioning, for example, their personal lives that you will not go into? It depends on how important those questions are within the context. I mean, you interviewed Robert Wagner. I interviewed Robert Wagner. And, and we had to talk about Natalie Wood. How could you do an interview without, without getting into that personal zone? But he, he talked about it. You know, I think the, the key is when you're talking about sensitive topics, you have to know where in the interview to inject them. If you do it too soon, it could, it could create a, an uneasy atmosphere. So I think a skill set is to know when to ask the sensitive questions so that you make the interview work overall. And if you build trust or in the beginning of the interview, they're more likely to discuss the sensitive topics as well. Yeah, I agree 100%. Who are the interviewers that you've looked up to in your life? Well, I, I love Dick Cavett. I thought he was the best. Uh, I, I liked uh, Bob Costas. And I like Larry King. I think he was underrated. Larry King got the most out of his guests, but he did it very nonchalantly. That was a skill set that he had. And I always, res I re always, res and Dick Cavett brought intelligence to the interview format. So, uh, and Bob Costas also, also well informed. So those three, I think, would be my top three interviewers. If I'm not mistaken, you interviewed Dick Cavett, didn't you? That was a big thrill. That was a big choice. It's like, you know, you're interviewing your hero. And he was he was fantastic. You know, I, I mean, I went when I went into the interview, you, you have the feeling I'm not worthy. You know, because he was the king of, of talk, really, and the best at it. He was very kind and he allowed me to get through the interview and create a compelling episode. That's just amazing. What a terrific opportunity to interview one of your own role models. It was great. Now, one of the things I really admire about you as an interviewer, Mickey, is that you make your interviews all about the guest, not about you. In my opinion, too many interviewers these days focus far too much on themselves instead of on their guest. Do you agree with that? 100%. And I, in my book, I, I write uh, there's a chapter on giving tips for potential interviewers and, and how to how to make a career out of it. And, and that's one of the things I, I, I write about in the book. You know, it's if, if you're interviewing uh, Joe Namath, nobody, you know, I, I've seen an interview where the interviewer says, oh, I ran into you in the bathroom at uh, Giant Stadium in 1955 or whatever. Nobody cares. 
they want to learn and know everything about Joe Namath. And your job as an interviewer is to get all that information out of him. And 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 I, I almost I, I sometimes see myself as a, a pitcher who's who's doing batting practice. So I'm just grooving the pitches in, into the batter so he looks his best. And I think as an interviewer, I try to do the same thing. Nothing is about me. It's all about the guest and, and bringing out the best in them and getting the most out of them. Amen to that. Now, you know, Mickey, when you and I were growing up, there were a lot of really great one-on-one -on -one interviewers besides Dick Cavett, like David Frost, James yep. Lipton, Barbara Walters, and others. They were what I call old school interviewers who dug deep and tried to give us a real sense of who the person was beneath the celebrity image. But nowadays you have all these two minute soundbite interviews on Entertainment Tonight and Access Hollywood. They're just a lot of fluff in my opinion. Do you think that interviewers like you and I are a dying breed? Well, we're trying to bring it back, Barbie, aren't we? Yeah. We're trying. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to bring it back. I mean, the one of the reasons that we started to produce profiles was for that exact reason. There aren't a lot of shows now that have in-depth interviews on television. And uh, yeah. I was doing another show called Special Edition. It was a news magazine. And in every show, we had a four-minute celebrity profile segment. And I went up to Sardi's to interview Danny Aiello. And I said, Danny, he had a caricature done of him and it was they were presenting it to him. And he said, sure, Mickey, no problem. So a after the festivities were over, we sat down and I'm looking for a four minute, five minute segment with him. We started talking and 45 minutes later, I knew his life story. So I went back to the, the studio and I said, I have a 45-minute a, a compelling interview with Danny Aiello and we can only use four minutes. That's criminal. We should consider doing a, a, another show called The Profiles and have these celebrities have an opportunity to share their stories in depth. And that was the, uh, the beginning of Profiles. That's very significant, that story that you just told, because first of all, it demonstrates that the celebrity whose time is valuable and who's not really interested in wasting his own time picked up on your skills yeah. and realized that this was a good use of his time. And number two, I'm very impressed that the network was willing to then create a show called Profiles, which would allow you to do these in-depth interviews. I, I wonder, are you a fan of the late night talk show hosts? Oh yeah, I watch I, I watch them all, but they're not in depth interviews. Again, they're five minute. You know, talk about the latest movie, the latest project, how's your family, and then they move on to the entertainment part of the show, right? So it's not in depth. Uh, but I like Jimmy Kimmel. I like him a lot. I think he does a great. He's my favorite uh, late night. Guy. Yeah, I like him too. I like Jimmy Fallon. Natural, you know, he's very, he's not affected at all. And uh, that's a skill set. Most celebrity interviewers are in Hollywood. Did you ever consider moving there? I never did. I'm a New York City born and bred. And I was just thrilled uh, to get back to New York and be able to do what I do here. Most journalists have to travel many other cities to work their way back to New York. So I was honored that I didn't have to do that. And I was able to create my career in the Big Apple. And I had I never had an interest to go to L.A. You've had so many legendary stars on your show. Do you ever get starstruck? Uh, that You know, that's a great question, Harvey, because I don't think I, I have. You know, because I've always looked at them as people, not necessarily celebrities. And I wanted to know what makes them tick, what the keys to their success have been. But I've never been starstruck. Uh, that's strange. I never thought about it. But uh, now that you bring it up, no, I, I, I never have. Have you? Yes, at the beginning. Well, you can imagine <laughs> I was a, a judge 
And I certainly did not deal with celebrities in my career. And when I started my show, it was a hobby. I just wanted to see if I could get anybody famous to talk to me because I always wanted to be an interviewer, never thinking that I would ever escalate to the point where we would be getting these legendary stars. And I did have to teach myself not to be starstruck. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing okay with it. You're a sweetie. Tell me... (laughs) Have you made a little list in your memory of some of the your favorite guests on your show? Well, you know, I, that's a question I'm asked all the time. Who are your favorite guests, right? But I've done 700 episodes. And I would say in every one of those episodes, including yours, there's a nugget that stays with you and is interesting and make the interview great. But I can go down a couple. I mean, one of my favorites was Eli Wallach. Good, Bad, and the Ugly, many Broadway shows. I, I interviewed him at 96 years old. He was still sharp as a tack. So I want to tell you a quick story. After the interview, he said, Mickey, do, do me a favor. Let's take a walk up Broadway. So it was a beautiful June afternoon. Here I am walking up. Broadway with Eli Wallach, one of the perks of the job, right? And as we're walking up this uh, Broadway, he's got a, a bag in his hand, you know, like a plastic bag from the supermarket. And I said, uh, Mr. Wallach, what do you have in the bag? And he said, shoes. That's where we're going. We're walking up to the cobbler. I'm going to get my shoes fixed. And I, I thought I would be funny. I wasn't, but I tried. And I said, Mr. Wallach, I didn't call him Eli. Mr. Wallach, why don't you just go to Macy's and buy 10 new pair? And he grabbed me by my wrist and stopped me in mid-stride, looked me straight in the eye, and he said, Mickey, I got to tell you, I grew up during the Depression. And he said, back then, we didn't buy new, we fixed old. And I've never been able to shake that. And I'm saying, oh, my God, I'm getting a life lesson from Eli Wallach besides a phenomenal interview. I'll never forget that day. You see, one of the perks of being the way you are, having your personality, is that your guests become your friends. I love that about you. That happens a lot. And and I love that. And I respect that. And I I cherish that. Have you ever been surprised by a guest? Uh, I, I think many, you know especially when they do something or say something that you don't expect. You know, I I, I remember Sally Kellerman from MASH, and then she was Rodney Dangerfield's love interest and back to school. So we're we're in the middle of her career interview, and then she stops me in the middle. And she said, Mickey, I got to tell you about Harrison Ford. And I'm saying, what is she going to tell? She, she's taking the interview away from me in the middle, you know. And she said, I hired, he before he was a star, he was a carpenter. So I hired him to build me a day bed. And she said, you know something? The day bed came out a foot too short. It's, and then she said, it's a good thing he made it as an actor. He was a lousy carpenter. <laughs> and now I didn't. I'm saying, where does it? Where did this come from? You know. And in another time, I had Chuck Barris on the show. Remember him from the Gong Show? Yes. And and, and in the middle of the interview, he stopped me, and he said, "Mickey, I got to tell you, you have a book in you. You should you should be writing a book." And I said, "Mr. Barrett, I don't have the time. You know that 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 takes a lot of time." He said, "No, I'll give you a tip. Do what I do." He said, write one page a day, and at the end of the year, you have your book. So he was the inspiration for me writing my memoir. You know what I think that means when those things happen during an interview? I think the guest is momentarily forgetting that they're being interviewed. They're (laughs) so in the moment. They're so in a conversation with you that you've made them actually forget. They that forget this the, is the show, right? They, and and I have one one other story. Same thing happened. Uh, Smokey Robinson, right? 
before weeks before, just like with you, you 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 send emails. What time is the interview? When it's going to happen? What to do? So the week before the interview, I got several emails from the his manager saying, "You have twenty five minutes, not a minute more." He's busy. We have other interviews. So the day the interview comes, and I had read somewhere that he was he's an avid golfer like I am. That's my hobby. And uh, he was struggling with his putting. So guys in, in the crew, we chipped in. We bought him a new putter. Right? So now, before we start the interview, I said, Smokey, I heard you were struggling with your putter. Here's a new putter. The, the crew got together and bought He was so touched by this gesture. He said, I've been in the business 50 years. You're lucky if you get a cup of coffee. And here we're giving him this putter. So now, fast forward, we're at around 23 minutes into the interview. And out of the corner of my eye, I see the manager in the back of the set going like this to me. Speed it up. you got two minutes like this. Smokey sees him. And he said, Tony, sit down. I'm talking to my brother, Mickey, and I'll tell you when we're done. Right? Bravo. Right? So we end up doing another 30 minutes. We did a two-parter, and one of that's one of them was the Emmy Award winning show. That is such a tribute to you once again. I have had that same experience, and I consider it such a thrill when the guest yeah. says, I don't care if we're running behind. I want to keep going. Right, right. And, and uh, I know Tony wasn't happy with it, but we got – I mean, we must have interviewed him for an hour and 20 minutes or something like that. Oh, you wanted to talk. You know, the first time we had Tony Orlando on the show, he broke yeah. down and cried. And I was so completely taken aback and so unprepared for that that I didn't really know what to do or say. And to this day, I wonder if I could have handled it better. And so I'm wondering, has that ever happened to you? Well, yeah, I've had a guest cry on the set. You know, you're touching a chord. You're touching something that is emotional for them. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and and I always say to them when they start crying, are you trying to win me another Emmy? <laughs> Keep crying. You know, that, that, that makes for a compelling episode. People can't get enough of that. And it's so genuine. I, I want to throw some names at you, Mickey, of people you've had on the show and get your reaction. Would that be okay? Absolutely. So let me start with one of my all-time favorites. She's appeared twice on your show. She told you that you are a fabulous interviewer, Miss Joan Rivers. Yeah, can you imagine Joan Rivers telling some telling me you're a fabulous interviewer? I was flying high after that compliment. Joan was brilliant giving, funny. I uh, had her on the show twice. And I think her her intelligence was underrated. She graduated number one in her class out of college. And I think her major, Harvey, you'd appreciate this, was anthropology. Interesting, right? And I, and I said, were you considering creating a career in anthropology? And she said, I was until they told me I couldn't bring my makeup along. So, yeah, I love her. I mean, she's one of my favorites of all time. Died way too too young. Shouldn't have happened. Oh, that's for sure. That was a tragedy. How Actually, about Ernest Borgnine? Uh, another one of my favorite. And interestingly, he was married to... Who was Ethel the Merman. Merman. And he, and he told the story about why they broke up. They lasted 30 days. They were in Hawaii on their honeymoon. Somebody had given him a moon rock. And he was showing it to people. And he was very popular from at that time because he had McHale's Navy. But she became very jealous that he was getting all the attention and nobody knew her. And she threw such a tizzy fit that... When they got back to the hotel, he said, this is not going to work. And of course, in her memoir, she's got a chapter uh, about her marriage to Ernest Borgnine, which is three blank pages. Yeah. Loved Ernest Borgnine. 
down to earth, giving again, and, uh, you know, was not, didn't carry himself like the star that he was. He's a regular guy. How about Carol Channing? Carol, you know, Carol Channing was so sweet. I can't tell you how sweet she was. And she also stopped the interview in the middle. And she said, Mickey, I got to stop this interview. I've never done an interview where the interviewer was more prepared than you. And then she went on. She said, I did a show last night with a young interviewer, reporter on a TV station. And you know how they started the interview? And I said, no, Carol, tell us. Well, they started by by saying, so, Carol, tell us what it is you do. Oh, the, the reporter didn't even know she had done 5,000 performances of Hello, Dolly. Right. But she was and, and it was interesting, Harvey, because she came to the interview with her junior high school sweetheart <clears throat> and they reunited after like 60 years and they got married. What a what lovely a- person she was. What about Joan Collins? What was it like to interview her? Well, there, there was a diva, right? And I had I had found something about her in doing my research. Uh, classy, beautiful, even though she was getting up there in years, she was still stunningly beautiful. I remember that. And I remember at one point, she couldn't find work. It was before Dallas. And she had to go to the unemployment office and get unemployment. And she said, how did you find out about that? And I was in an old article. But the problem is she went to the unemployment office in a gown she was going to wear to the Oscars because she had a photo shoot afterwards. (laughs) And she said, it didn't look too good that I needed unemployment with this, you know, $10,000 gown on. So she was great, beautiful. Do you have any fun memories of interviewing Ed Asner? Uh, uh, yeah, I do. You know, just the, he was very serious, you know, and he was very concerned. He was ahead of the Actors Union, I think, at the time. But ju- just I was surprised. He was very serious and it was, uh, you know, question and answer, but no levity. I like to interject a little bit of levity. He was very serious. That's what I remember about him. I think one of your most special interviews was with Maya Angelou. Yeah, well, that was the one where I definitely said, I'm not worthy. And I knew I was way over my head. But she was kind, and she allowed me to feel that I wasn't over my head. And I I said to her, do you realize how people love you and love you work? And, and, and how talented you are. Do you realize your skills? And, and then she went on and gave me this whole comparison to, uh, you know, talent is the same as electricity. <laughs> you know, I said, oh, really? We really don't know what it is or how it works, but we utilize it to the best of our ability. And I said, there's another life lesson. What a thrill to, to sit down with her. At the time, she was America's greatest poet. One of my favorite guests as well. Very giving as well. Would you ever interview a politician? I have. You know, my next guest is Bill Bradley. And he ran for president. You know, and I've done, I think I've had borough presidents. Yeah, I've done politicians in the past. Problem with that is the network that I work for is paid for by the city of New York. So you have to be very careful if you're interviewing an adversary of the person that's writing the checks for the network and they say bad things about the person writing the checks. (laughs) So we kind of shun away from politicians. Uh, Have you uh, done politicians so far? No, and I won't. Why is that? Well, I spent my entire career after becoming a lawyer as a judge, and I've just been trained to be apolitical. And honestly, I'm not interested. I much prefer the world of pop culture and show business, so I stay away from them. Yeah. I mean, I I, I, yeah, I try to stay away from it as well. I did an interview 
the other day for the first time out of the 700 episodes, kind of on a landmark as opposed to a person. And I, I went out to the uh, TWA, hotel, uh, TWA terminal at Kennedy Airport, which is now a New York City landmark. And it was built in 1962 by Howard Hughes. It was fascinating. I interviewed the CEO who renovated it. And uh, and that was a hotel, actually. Now, for those people watching this interview who are not in the New York area, I know some of your interviews, Mickey, are on your YouTube channel, but not all of them. So have you ever considered setting up a website where people can pay to watch your interviews? Well, you know, this the reason that it is the way it is, is I have a syndication company that sells it around the world. Uh, they've sold it in Japan. They've sold it in the Bahamas. And they feel that if we put it up on YouTube, we're giving it a, giving the episodes away and it becomes harder for them to sell the series. So that's the reason we don't do it. Well, that's why I asked you whether you've considered a website where people pay to see the interviews. And I suggest that because... <laughs> You've interviewed so many legendary stars who are no longer with us. And those interviews are important pieces of show business history, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. It's something that that I'm going to bring up at our next meeting and consider that. Yeah, I totally understand why you don't want to give it away. But I think yeah. people would pay to see some of your interviews because there is no one else like you that interviews the way you do. I know that from personal experience. And those interviews are magic. Now, yeah. if you could interview three people, living or dead, who would you choose? Uh, that's a great question. I haven't thought, you know, I, I always wanted to interview Raquel Welch. I, I met Tom Jones. I never, I, I met him, talked to him, but I've never had him on the show. So Tom, Tom Jones uh, would be the second. And Pete Rose, the baseball player, would be the third. I had him scheduled once and he canceled, but he, because I find him fascinating with his gambling background and being excluded from the Baseball Hall of Fame. So those are the three people that I would have on the top of my list. And so, I have a section in my book with the people that those people, by the way, that I didn't get, but I would love to have. Spoken like a true straight man. Now, if you want to hear from a gay man, my three would be Princess Diana, Judy yeah. Garland, and Barbara Streisand. <laughs> you may get Barbara Streisand. What's the most rewarding thing for you about being an interviewer? Uh, that I walk away with, with nuggets in, in every interview, and I walk away with life lessons, and, and that I can build a compelling interview that people can sit in their living rooms and enjoy and appreciate. That, that that's about it. It's it's so gratifying, you know. I had uh, Burt Young on the show uh, from Rocky. You know Burt Young, the actor. Yeah. And to me, after the interview, Mickey, you must feel great after you do such a good job, and man, you must be flying after the interviews. And I said, I feel pretty good. It, it makes my day. Do you think that the celebrities we have today are as interesting to the public as the big legendary stars who were out there when we were growing up? Yeah, probably not. You know, the legendary stars like Eli Wallach and and uh, Ernest Borgnine and Carol Channing have such a history. You know, uh, they've had trials and tribulations for decades. Today, I think the... The celebrities are, I don't know, just feel like this is coming to them. You know, uh, they're not as interesting. And I don't think they, they had to pay their dues the way the old time people did. That That's just my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a sense of entitlement among the younger generation. Yeah, definitely. I did want to mention uh, my next project. I'm going to do a one man play. I'm working really? on. Tell us about that. Well, it's a you know I I was speaking at a workshop for screenwriters, I, and they wanted to know about the show, how it started, blah blah blah. You know, so I I was telling them a lot of the stories I shared with you today, 
and at the end, there's like 40 screenwriters in the audience. And at the end, I said, does anybody have a question? And simultaneously, 40 hands went up. <laughs> I said, that was so great. I wish I had a photo of that, you know? So I said, they're interested in, in, in the history of the show. Uh, they're interested in many of the stories that come with it. And I said, I can do a one-man play, and, and I would enjoy it, and I think the fans of the show would like it. Show some clips, tell some stories. It's a win-win. I think that is a fabulous idea because you do have those clips to flesh out your stories. Yes. I also think you would be a great teacher to people who want to be interviewers because there's no place you can really learn. You just have to watch. Yeah. You've interviewed so many famous people. I'm wondering if you've learned anything over the years about what it's like to be famous. I don't think it's I don't I don't think it's that important. You know, I had Joe Piscopo on the show and we talked about that topic. And he said, uh, because he's famous from Saturday Night Live and all, all that he's done. And I asked him that question. This is the one you asked me. And he said, in the end, nobody cares. He said, the only one that really cares about your fame are the people that love you and your family. So. That's the way I feel about it. When I had Rona Barrett on the show, I asked her this question, and I'm going to ask you as well. Have you been able to figure out why some celebrities have not been able to handle their success and being famous after working so hard to get there? Yeah, I think money has a lot to do with it. You know, I mean, today, celebrities are not like when Ernest Borgnine was, was doing McHale's Navy. Maybe he made $50,000 a year. Today, if you're a, a real star, you're making multi-million dollar endorsements plus your salary. And I think a lot of them can't handle the financial aspect and, and, and they go crazy. You know, they, they, they get into drugs. They get, you know, women, they, it's women, it's, the, it's sex. And uh, I, I think the money is, is the root of the problem in my opinion. Do you have any thoughts on the current state of the industry compared to when you were starting out? Yeah. You know, before cable, they were, there were seven, cha seven channels today. There's 500 channels. So you have to work extra hard to get your share of that audience. Right. And I think about that all the time. And how do you do that? By being excellent. Simple as that. If you're mediocre, you're not going to get any share. If you're if you if you're presenting a product that is different and unique, then you have a shot at getting a share of that audience and maintaining it. But it's hard. It's harder than it used to be, and it's getting harder all the time because now you not only have the 500 channels, but you have podcasts and uh, the internet and uh, social media. So a lot of competition for the eyeballs. Yeah, for sure. Although I think that you and I have just focused on being the best we can be and we don't worry about the competition. I agree with you 100%. You know, I, I, you, you'd asked me a question before and I wanted to tell you the story about uh, do you ever get uh, a story from your guest that surprises you? That was your question. And I had Lou Graham on, the, the lead singer of Farina. And in his, in his memoir, I didn't read that section. I missed it where he said he was on death's door. And I said, well, what happened? And he said he, he was, you know, 20 something years ago, he was getting migraines. And he was having long and short term memory loss. As, and he's still performing to, you know, sold out arenas. And so he went and got an MRI. And his doctor in Rochester told him, you have a mass on your brain. And it had tentacles that was wrapped around your pituitary gland. So I'm going to send you into Manhattan to see a doctor, an expert there, specialist. And he did. And the doctor saw the MRI and said, go home and get your affairs together. You have about two months to live. So he went home. He was getting his affairs together. 
I, I didn't expect this, Arby. You know, you know, I was like almost fell off my chair. He's 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 getting his affairs together, and he's watching sixty minutes. And there's a segment on a doctor from Boston who does brain surgery with laser. So he, he saw the doctor's name. He got the information on online. Called up the next day, and they said, "If you fly in tomorrow, the doctor can see you." He did. That was on a Tuesday. Wednesday morning, he was in surgery. He wakes up from surgery. He said to the doctor, boy, that was fast. You know, I, he said, yeah, that was three days ago. He was out for three days. To make the, the story, he, they were able to get all of it. That was 23 years ago. And he said, if I didn't, wasn't watching 60 Minutes, I would have been dead 23 years ago. Is that a great story or what? Wow. And what did you say to him when he told you that story? Because you were so surprised. I said, that doctor is your angel. He said, absolutely. Absolutely. I go back for checkup every year. I'm good. I think he should make a commercial for 60 minutes. I th <laughs> absolutely, Harvey. Absolutely. I thought that was one of my favorite stories of how uh, it's uh, that was a miracle story kind of thing, you know? Oh, very much so. So, Mickey, when you look back at your career, has there been one defining moment or one particular experience that was particularly memorable and meaningful to you? Well, you know, you had mentioned it prior. And that is, uh, I mean, you, we do what we do, but it's hard to judge your ability and your performance yourself. So I think, you know, when, when Joan Rivers stopped the interview and said, Mickey, you're a fantastic interviewer. That meant a lot. And, and I love, you know, it just made me feel like I belonged and that, you know, I should continue doing what I'm doing. And I'm always trying to get better, by the way. You know, when I do an episode, I watch that episode. And I, should have I followed up that question with this question? Could have I made this interview a little bit better? Uh, what did I forget to ask that I, that I should have? So, you know, I, I can't tell you how many musicians I've had, like Kenny G, right? And he said, you know, I'm trying to get better every day. I get up in the morning. I practice every day to get better. So I kind of take that attitude as an interviewer. I'm trying to improve all the time, you know? And I hope that answered that question. Yeah, beautifully. And I can't imagine you being any better than you are, but I love the fact that you always want to keep learning. Do you yeah. ever think about retirement? No, no. I, I, you know, a lot of people ask that question, you know, because I'm not getting any younger, uh, but I still have the vital. I'm still in good health. Uh, I still have the drive to want to do it. So where I'm at right now is as long as the, and I have a great team. You met my team. You know, some of them, some of them weren't there that day, but I have a great loyal team, editors who weren't there. We've been with me 20 years. But as long as the network allows me to do it, I I would like to do it. And I'm, I'm not a fan of age discrimination. You know, I think we bring a lot to the table more so than a 20 something interviewer with no life experience. I think that's very true, particularly when you're interviewing a legend. Yes. And you have the familiarity with their career and their body of work, and you have the gravitas and the maturity to right. be able to sit down with people who are veterans in this business and ask intelligent questions. So I'm glad you're not going to retire, but I do hope that at some point you will conduct a seminar for podcasters and talk show hosts on how to conduct a good interview because there's so many bad ones out there. Yes. Especially ever since Zoom was invented, there are literally thousands of people out there launching podcasts with no idea of how to conduct a proper interview. But, but think of it this way, Harvey. Those bad ones make you look really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Uh, you are you good. You are good but they make you look even better. I really appreciate that. I have to tell you, it was such a delight to meet you and to be on your show. And it's been an absolute delight having you on our show. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me, Mickey. Bobby, it was my pleasure. 
a thrill anytime. Uh, and I just want to say continued success uh, with your show, with your series. You do a great job. Continue with it. Thank you so much, Mickey. That means the world to me and all the best to you too. Our guest has been New York's most popular and beloved talk show host, Mickey Burns. If you live in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or Connecticut, don't miss his show, Profiles, on the NYC Media Network. You can also follow him on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel, which you can see now on your screen. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistants, Rosa Puzo and Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.